Good morning, and welcome to the First Christian Church Worship. My name is Ken Rambo. Pastor Laura has taken some well-deserved time off, and it is my pleasure to join you this morning in this hour of prayer. We come together from many different backgrounds. We bring with us many different life stories. And as we continue to endure and overcome in this time of this COVID epidemic, we come together from even different locations. And whether we are gathering virtually through modern technology or gathering here in person, we are bound together as brothers and sisters in the name of Christ. Let us pray together in his name. O holy God, you have called us together in spirit, whether in our homes or in this beautiful house of prayer to worship you. In your time, you have created us, and in you we live and we move and we have our being. You have put eternity in our hearts, and you have given us a yearning and a hunger for fulfillment that comes only from you. And it is this yearning, it is this hunger that has pulled us together this morning. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would take these moments, use them to teach us of your truth and your grace, and may our hearts be renewed as we sing of and as we meditate on your love, your mercy, and your hope. And this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Well, hello again. I've just been doing a little bit of decorating for Valentine's Day. Hey, can any of you tell me what we celebrate on Valentine's Day? That's right, it's love. <laughs> love sure is something that we talk an awful lot about, isn't it? For instance, I would tell you that I love chocolate. Mmm. I also love a good book, too. Hey, do you have a pet? I bet you would say that you love your pet. Or how about mom and dad? Do you tell them that you love them? And do they tell you they love you, too? I'll bet you do. Can you name some other things that you love? Go ahead and shout them out. Wow, those are really great things to love, for sure. Hey, let's check out what the Bible has to say about love. If you remember last time, we talked about what Jesus said in Mark 12, verses 30 through 31. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandments greater than these. And we can find this in John 15 verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Hmm. Jesus wanted us to know how important love is. If we love each other, then we will take care of each other. Not because we have to, but because we want to. And you don't need to buy someone a box of chocolates to show them how much you love them. Because a hug and a smile are really great too. And don't forget those three little words, I love you you. Hey, before you go, let's have a really quick prayer, okay? Okay, okay. let's bow our heads just like this. Dear God, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God, thank you for loving us so much and for sending Jesus to teach us how to love each other. Please help us to be patient and kind as we learn important lessons about love all throughout our lives so we can be more like Jesus. Help all of the people in this world to understand the love you have given so there will be no more hate and sorrow 
but instead love and joy. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friends, until we meet again, stay safe, stay well, and be blessed. Good morning. As I mentioned before, my name is Ken Rambo, and I was very grateful when my sister Nicole texted me early one morning last week and asked if I would be available to fill the pulpit for Pastor Laura as she takes some time off. And I was thrilled to do so, not only because it gave me a chance to preach again, but also gave me a chance to preach in my birth church, if you will, for this is the church that I was born into and the church that I went to as a small child. Now, normally when I'm asked to preach, I usually uh, preach an expository sermon. I like to lift a piece of scripture out of the Bible and, and read it. What does it say? And then learn myself what it means and communicate that then to the congregation and then to take what we learned and how to apply it to life. But on this occasion, uh, as I'm preaching in my birth church, I would like to take an opportunity maybe to walk down memory lane, if you will, um, meditate on some scripture and throw in a little bit of testimony uh, for good measure. I selected a few um, passages. By the way, I entitled this sermon, God is great, now I lay me down to sleep. And you may guess the subject matter is uh, child, childhood prayers. I selected a few passages, one from Matthew 18 that speaks of uh, Jesus uh, talking about childlike faith. And I also selected Psalm 23. And I did that because of its expression of childlike faith. And it has just a beautiful simplicity to it that we can hold near and dear to our hearts, easy to remember, easy to take with us wherever we go. So listen to the word of God through the psalmist, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child, and he had him stand among them, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, as I mentioned before, my Christian journey began right here in this church when this congregation worshiped down in Medina there in, in South Broadway. My mom and dad met in that church in Sunday school when they were 13 years old, somewhere around 1956. Well, they dated, they married, and eventually I came along. And I was dedicated in that beautiful sanctuary. And I attended Sunday school classes until we moved to the new United Methodist Church just up the street from where we lived in Chippewa Lake. And some of my earliest memories are of climbing up that stairwell that seemed to make a lot of noise as kids were going up and down and doors were slamming. And I remember even at a young age, a sense of holiness in that, that sanctuary where you always whispered if you even spoke at all. And aside from my family, I can only remember a few names, the Aikmans, the Mishlers, and the Nortons. Now, my mom helped me remember the Nortons because the Norton girls babysitted me when I was a little kid. And of course, the Kaufmans. I have to remember them, for they're my family. And as a child, I can tell you that I don't remember a single Sunday school lesson, and I don't remember 
a single sermon that the pastor preached. I can't even remember who the pastor was. But what I do remember is this, a sense of security when I was there with you people, a sense of love, a sense of happiness that was in that church, in this church. It was a place that reinforced what my parents were teaching me at home and simply this, that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, when we are children, we have such a simple faith. It's taught to us by our parents or our Sunday school teachers, or our pastors. And Jesus, as seen in this scripture, is very much attracted to children and their childlike trust. Let them come to me, he said. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it, he teaches his disciples. And so what does it mean to receive the kingdom of God like a little child? Well, there are two prayers that we prayed in our home, and I would bet that many people as they were young prayed them in their homes also that helped me understand what Jesus means by receiving the kingdom of God, receiving the kingdom of heaven with the faith of a child. The first prayer is one that we said at mealtime. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for this food. Amen. And it got me to wondering as a small child, well, how great is God really? Well, the Bible begins with God revealing to us just how great he is with the very first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you can't get much greater than that, can you? And it's a pretty simple thing to understand that God created everything. But how he did it, well, that's not so easy. But we're not called to understand how he did it. We're called to believe that he did do it. For God created all there is out of nothing by his sheer will and the power of his word. That's beyond our understanding. But to know and believe that simple truth is to receive the kingdom of God like a child. Psalm 8, 1 and 2 is one of my favorites. O Lord, our our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. When I consider the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You know, for the last 20 some years, my wife Brenda and I and um, our family, we lived in town and uh, the town had large trees around us. And, um, you know, we couldn't see much beyond the trees. But now we live out in Egypt Road on Lafayette, out in the country, if you will. And we have no trees in our yard. We have two acres of nothing. But, you know, we see the most glorious sunsets and the most wonderful filled, uh, star-filled skies. And a lot of times when one of us begins to witness this sunset or these stars, they'll come in the house and they'll grab who, who is ever in there and they'll say, come out, you gotta see this sky. And we go out and we look up and we're in awe. And you know why that is? It's because the eternity that God has placed into our heart is beginning to connect with God's greatness. God is great. How great is God? He created all things. He sustains all things. He knows all things. He is everywhere at all times. He contains all power within himself. And though we cannot fathom the full greatness of God, we are called to wonder like children at his greatness and worship him for his greatness. Well, God is great. Well, how good is God? Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. The psalmist in 119, 68 says of God, you are good 
and what you do is good. You have noticed a, a yard sign popping up in the area that says, see the good on it. Maybe you've seen these signs. And you know, that's, that's a good thing to think about as we are all searching for what is good and what is just and what is right right now. But it brings up the question, well, what is goodness? How do we know what is good? And just because I think something is good, does that really mean that it is good? I think the Apostle Paul does a pretty good job of defining goodness in Philippians 4.8 when he says this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, this may not be an exhaustive list of what is good, but it's a good start. These words these concepts, these things that we are to think about is also a description of God's goodness. It's a description of the things of his creation that reflect his goodness. And so we can understand through the scriptures that God is the standard by which we may say something is good or something is not good. And so as it pertains to childlike faith, in God's goodness, I want to look at just two ways that God is good. Now, there are, again, multiple ways that God is good and that he expresses his goodness, but I want to just bring up two foundational goodnesses of God, if you will. I want to bring up the goodness of his law and the goodness of his grace. Our greatest needs, if you think about it, are for the goodness of God's law so that there will be order in this fallen world. And our other greatest need is for the goodness of his forgiving grace when we fall short, short of his law. God demands that we do whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, all those things. But that's easier said than done. Again, ask a child the simple question, do you always do what you should? And they'll probably say, no, I do not. Ask them, do you sometimes do things you shouldn't do? And they'll probably say, yes, I do that too. Well, you know, it's the same problem that we adults have, isn't it? As a matter of fact, it's the same problem the whole world has. That truth exposes the fact that we need the goodness of God's grace because we fail to live up to the goodness of his law. God's ultimate goodness to you and me is found in Romans 5, 8. It states, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God's goodness is revealed in his law and his goodness is also revealed in his grace that undeserved favor he shows us through his son, Jesus. Again, by no means do my thoughts exhaust the meaning of God's greatness or goodness. I'm just trying to keep it simple. So two simple things we can know from this simple prayer. God is great and worthy of our praise. And God is good, deserving of our trust and our gratitude. To simply believe in the greatness and the goodness of God is to receive the kingdom of God like a child. The other prayer goes like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, nighttime can be scary for a small boy with an active imagination. In our bedroom, there was a door that leads to the attic. And I was sure there were times when these creatures were behind the door, beckoning me to open the door and let them out. Well, a nightlight was a must to ward off the darkness and to silence my imaginary tormentors. I once heard a comedian and part of his routine refer to this prayer exactly as I said it. And he said his parents had turned him into a 
paranoid insomniac because they forced him to think about dying just before they turned off the lights. As a matter of fact, I think as parents, we were kind of worried about that. So we had a substitute about the, you know, if I die before I wake part. But you know what? As I think back, I don't think I ever saw that way as a small child. To me, this prayer was a spiritual nightlight. When I prayed this prayer with my mom and my dad, seeds of truth were being planted in my heart. I already knew from our mealtime prayer that God was great and God was good. And at bedtime, I was learning that I am a mortal being with not only a body, but a soul. And I was learning that God was not only the keeper of my body, but he was the keeper of my soul as well. I was learning that whether I am awake or whether I am asleep, God is tenderly watching over me. I was learning that I near not, need not fear death or anything else for that matter. For God is watching over me. And if I go to sleep and never wake up, I knew that this great and good God would take me to heaven. One of my favorite passages to contemplate, one of my favorite subjects to contemplate, contemplate is heaven. And I refer often to John 14, the opening verses where Jesus is meeting with his disciples and they are being tempted to fear for night has fallen and they sense bad things are coming. Here's what he tells them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you and I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. When I ministered to older folks, one of my favorite sayings to them was this, God has gotten us this far. He's going to take us the rest of the way home. We can believe that. And folks, we're going somewhere. God is moving time forward. We're going somewhere and it is not this fallen world. It's like that old song, this is not my home. I'm just passing through. There's a place being prepared for us, so says Jesus. And he will watch over us and he will care for us while we are here. And when the time is right, when our place, is, place with him is ready, he will come take us to be where he is. Therefore, whether awake or asleep, God watches over us body and soul. The sovereignty of God is indeed a pillow upon which we can lay our heads every night. And so there is some simple yet solid theology in these prayers, these childlike prayers. And there's three things that we can take from these childhood prayers. God is great. God is good. God watches over us and will one day take us to heaven. These simple truths are seeds of faith that when nurtured by the Spirit of God, especially through the Word of God and through prayer and through obedience and through gathering of, of God's people, they will grow and flourish into a faith that will carry us happily through life, even during times of great difficulties. But the seeds must be nurtured or we will forget. I left the church somewhere around 15 years old. I just quit going. Therefore, I was not being nurtured. I had the basics. I had the seeds, but I had no growth. Therefore, as I grew in my body and I grew in my life experiences, my childlike faith became childish faith which is a failing faith. I began to question God's greatness. If God is so great, then why do bad things happen to good people? I began to question his goodness. If God is so good, then why does he allow bad things 
to happen at all, and I began to doubt his care that he's watching over me when I would ask, well, if God is watching over me, why do bad things happen to me? I began to ask those questions, but had no interest in seeking the answers, really. And so at 18, I joined the Navy. I traveled the world. I married my beautiful wife, Brenda. We had four boys. My childlike faith continued to fade and continued to fail. I felt as if my very life was fading and failing. And it wasn't until I reunited my childlike faith with the nurturing love of a church family and the nurturing spirit of God's word did my childlike faith begin to grow to meet the level of my adult experiences, that my childlike faith began to grow to address my adult problems, to meet my adult needs, and to deal with my adult sins. And as I rested in the love of a church family, and as I met God in his word, I began to believe again that God is great. He's majestic. I began to believe in believe again that God is good and he's abundant in redeeming love. I began to believe again that he does providentially watch over me, and my family, my friends, and really the whole world. I began to believe and know again that one day I will be with him forever. I served as a American Legion chaplain for the last 12 years in Columbiana, Ohio. Brenda and I, along with two friends, we held a chapel service at a local assisted living uh, place called Whispering Pines there in Columbiana. It's one of those places where as kids we called old folks homes, if you know what I mean. Well, my little congregation was, well, they're all old folks. And the, the congregation was always changing. Old age would bring in new members, but death would take away others. And you know, in those 12 years, I noticed something. I noticed how those precious people, as they grew old, they began to have so much in common with very young children. And I began to understand it in this way. As they grew older, they became frail again, like little children. As they grew older, they became dependent on others to care for them again, like little children. And as they grew older, they began to own fewer and fewer possessions as they could only fit so much into their little rooms, just like little children again. And it seemed to me, as I watched these old saints, it seemed to me that their desires of life began to narrow down to the simplest of things. Food and comfort for one. Love of family and friends, very important. But it seems to me the greatest thing, the greatest need that they had was to keep that simple faith in God. A simple faith that God is great, that God is good, that God watches over them, and God will one day, maybe even soon, take them to heaven. Isn't it beautiful that the simple faith of a child ends up being the rock-solid faith of the aged? Isn't it beautiful that the simple faith of a child ends up being the rock-solid faith of the aged? That, that is what it means to receive the kingdom of God like a child. The prominent pastor and theologian Karl Barth, there's a story about him that uh, he was once asked near the end of his working life when he grew old, if he could summarize his life, life's work in one sentence. And it's said that he thought about it for a moment and he says, yes, I can. If I could summarize all my life's work into one sentence, it would be this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible 
tells me so. We can never be children again, but the Lord commands that we remain childlike in our simple praise, our simple trust, and our simple enjoyment of God. Because God is great, and God is good, and God is watching over us, and God will one day take us to heaven. Let us pray. Lord, you are our great and good shepherd. Therefore, all we need is found in and from you. You lead us through life and give us rest in green pastures of your abundant love. Like calm waters, your Holy Spirit gives us strength and restoration as we rest in your grace. And from the day we are born, you guide us through life, showing us through your living word the paths of righteousness. And as we grow older, Lord, we fear not the approaching shadow, for you have passed through that valley yourself, and yet you live. Your victory over death com comforts us through the trials and the tribulations of this fallen world. Your promise of life eternal is like a feast before us as we anticipate with great joy the coming redemption of all things in the new heaven and earth. From birth, you have blessed us beyond measure. Your goodness and love has overflowed every day of our fleeting lives. And even upon our last day, it will be but our first day, for we will dwell in your beautiful mansion of glory forever. With childlike faith, we praise you for your greatness, and we are humbled by your goodness, and we rest in your care, and we rejoice in all your heavenly promises. Amen. Jesus, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus and all that he has graciously done for us. it's been a blessing to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I am so grateful in my heart that I was uh, had the opportunity to do this and uh, just like this church know that uh, you'll always be my first church and uh, you have a special place in my heart. Now let us pray. A God of grace and mercy and overwhelming love, send us now into your world with a childlike but maturing faith. Let us proclaim to the tired and weary your greatness, your goodness, and your benevolent care. Let us with joy live in the light of all your heavenly promises, and let us be to others what you are to us. Bless and keep us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.